Economic and global strategic policy has relied for far too long on the extrapolation of past and current events to make decisions that will determine the lives of humanity in the future. We rely too much on precedent. We're now reached a point where all policy must start from a conception of the future and formed by the human creative imagination, working backwards to define present policy and no less. So unless mankind decides to go for a complete victory to this end, pushing the bounds of human knowledge, enabling us to leap and not merely tiptoe into the future, there's very little guarantee that we'll survive the current threats before us, both terrestrial as well as galactic. Fortunately, recent developments in Russia, namely the revival of Lyndon LaRouche's Strategic Defense Initiative, points to the kind of future orientation that if the United States joins, will be the greatest strategic flank to a human mass extinction, either by the threat of world war or cosmic annihilation, which at this point are two sides of the same catastrophic coin. The hallmark of Mr. LaRouche's original concept for an SDI was not merely deterring nuclear weapons with laser-based technology. Missile defense had become the means for the real solution to the Cold War, an economic crisis. The initiation of a joint science driver program between the economies of the West and the East to make new scientific breakthroughs in uncharted territory. This program was eventually adopted by Ronald Reagan but under the auspices of the British financial empire and their agent in Russia, Gorbachev, it was abandoned. The SDI sat at the edge of human knowledge, pushing the envelope on areas of knowledge in terms clearly defined by scientist Bernard Riemann, who, in his 1854 habilitation dissertation, demanded that science had to leave the domain of mathematics and sense perception and plunge into the domain of physics and ontological reality, confronting the paradoxes that inevitably arise in the infinitely large and the infinitesimally small. The SDI sought to embrace Riemann's challenge to science by diving into groundbreaking areas whose offshoots and benefits would give us laser fusion, plasma technologies, advanced isotope separation, powerful superconducting magnets, biospheric engineering, optical biophysics, matter-antimatter reactions, and revolutions in the medical field, especially with respect to disease, and an overall capability to leave Earth and colonize our solar system, and in doing this, freeing mankind from the slavery of his own sense perception, replacing those shackles with a Promethean fire to fashion our universe. Now with a revived SDE, the IGMAS project, and also a push into the uncharted territory of the Arctic, this is what we can revive, a galactic perspective now. New paradoxes and potential can be forced to the surface and confronted directly, and mankind may just find a way out of the present war danger and lack of creative imagination to not merely survive, but also to create what could be the future now in the present. So before we begin, let's review a few things we should have already known. In the very large, the lessons of Vladimir Vernatsky has taught us that we exist within a cosmic medium with many forms of radiation permeating our universe, not particles bumping into each other. This has become more and more clear as our investigations into more seismic, volcanic, magnetic, and weather phenomena have shown that all these terrestrial changes correspond to larger changes in solar, electromagnetic, and various forms of cosmic radiative cycles. And those cycles correspond to even larger 62 million year and 140 million year galactic evolutionary cycles, the same cycles which have been correlated with mass creation and mass extinction of entire species. Currently, the large or macroscopic domain hovers over us, warning of a period within our galaxy where there is no reason to believe that mankind won't end up like the dinosaurs as we approach a crucial point in our motion through the galaxy. Perhaps shifting our attention away from the macroscopic domain, 
to the microscopic domain can provide some needed insight to curtail that threat from above. And our starting point here will be the mysterious case of the virus. And shifting our attention here, we hope to gain a deeper understanding of the nature of this cosmic electromagnetic domain, an understanding of how the universe communicates, and the creative nature of the universe in general, which seems to reflect the creative nature of the human mind. So in this first episode, we'll introduce some of the fundamentals of the anti-entropic evolutionary implications of the virus as a starting point. A virus is thought to be a piece of genetic material, DNA or RNA, wrapped up in protein or caspin. Since viruses don't have the metabolic machinery to reproduce themselves, they remain inert until they infect a host cell which they primarily depend on to become active and reproduce. This infection and reproduction is often lethal, killing the host cells the virus infects and are therefore commonly associated with diseases of various kinds. It's assumed that the word virus automatically means something bad, but this conclusion only comes from a lack of knowledge, as viruses may actually turn out to be beneficial and helpful for organisms of all kinds for a very long time. What do I mean? Okay. <laughs> viruses are one of the most common and abundant biological creatures in the ocean, and their presence on a planetary scale has benefited us more than you might have realized. It's been estimated that about 60% of the genes needed for photosynthetic activity, the PSBA genes, in the marine environment for which an origin could be identified were actually from viruses that infect bacteria, known as phage. Furthermore, a rough calculation suggests that some 10% of the total global photosynthesis could be carried out as a result of PSBA genes originally from these viruses. Now, with respect to individual organisms, we also find cases where viruses don't necessarily play the role of a killing or disease agent. Take the case of the Elysia chloronica, the solar-powered sea slug. It's one of the few animals that have the ability to photosynthesize, blurring the line between animal and plant kingdoms. Green plants are known to get their energy from the sun which they use to transform water and carbon dioxide into the carbohydrates which form their bodies, and the free oxygen which they release into the atmosphere for creatures like ourselves to breathe. Normally, animals get their nutrients from the carbohydrates already existing in plants or other animals by eating them. But, in the case of the Elysia chlorotica, we have an animal that skips the middleman and itself photosynthesizes to produce its own nutrients. It sucks out the contents of an algae called Valkyria, but does not digest the chloroplasts which are responsible for photosynthesis. These chloroplasts, it passes through its stomach lining into a network of cells which lie just underneath the translucent skin of the slug. These chloroplasts transform the slug from its original brown color to a brilliant green, like a leaf. In their new home, the chloroplasts continue their work, transforming water and carbon dioxide into vital nutrients and oxygen. Only now, these components serve to feed the slug. The slug no longer needs to eat, for like the plant, it now gets all of its energy from the sun. Elysia chlorotica can now survive the next nine or so months of its life without needing to eat except perhaps to refresh its store of stolen chloroplasts. In the spring, at the end of its life, the slug produces eggs and sperm and cross-fertilizes with another slug, and each produces a long strand of eggs. All adults die almost simultaneously a short time later, leaving the eggs to mature and hatch into larvae after about a week. How did the sea slug acquire this ability to photosynthesize? And how do all the adult slugs die simultaneously? At some point during its evolutionary development, the sea slug was infected by a retrovirus that somehow transferred key genes from the algae to the nucleus of the slug, 
enabling the slug to photosynthesize when it steals and consumes the chloroplasts from the algae. The retrovirus has also become a part of the slug's genome, enabling the slug never having to be infected again. But the same retrovirus, which gives the sea slug life, at the end of the life cycle seems to be triggered in all of the adult slugs, reproducing itself en masse, evoking a mass cull soon after the eggs are laid for the next offspring. Here we have some curious evidence for a refined view of evolution, in fact, which challenges the Darwinian view on a number of counts. First, we have the case of a virus infecting a subject whose infection seems to benefit the organism as opposed to killing it or making it sick, refuting the simple notion of survival of the fittest and natural selection. The virus gives it genes that give the organism a new power. Furthermore, what need does a virus have for a photosystem in the first place? Viruses don't photosynthesize, and they don't contain either chloroplasts or chlorophyll the way plants do. In fact, as far as we can tell, when they're not interacting with an organism, they don't do anything. But what's interesting is in the case of the sea slug, these viruses almost seem like they're intended to give this capability to other species and intended to play a much larger role and beneficial role in the evolutionary process. Further, researchers found that photosystems were not the only capabilities carried by these viruses in the sea. All kinds of traits and abilities useful only to other organisms were found to be contained within many other viruses in the ocean. Perhaps gene pool should be the proper name for ocean. Secondly, we also have a case of horizontal gene transfer. Vertical gene transfer occurs when traits from a parent are passed down to their offspring in childbirth, for example. But with the sea slug, we have the case of horizontal gene transfer, where it appears that the virus, seemingly unrelated to the sea slug, mediates and carries the traits that originally belonged to the algae, a plant, over to the slug, an animal, allowing it to use the chloroplast it stole from the algae to power itself. Given this odd symbiotic relationship, are we even to believe now that the slug is a separate organism from the virus and vice versa? Maybe it's wrong to treat a virus as a distinct entity at all. And maybe it's impossible to define viruses or organisms in terms of their individual characteristics. But these are no individual objects but organisms which play a role in a larger process with a definite intention to it. The question then becomes, what's the nature of that intention which brings together a virus and algae and a slug, making them act to a common end as if one organism? How might such a seemingly invisible intention be organized, and how is it communicated to the individual organisms? To come closer to an answer to that question, let's zoom back out to the macroscopic domain. The fact that viruses could play such a significant role in evolutionary development should cause us to ask what their relationship is to such long-range evolutionary cycles, as in the case of the 62 million year cycle and the 140 million year cycle from the fossil record. These cycles, in turn, as we know, correlate to changes we either have experienced or detected on Earth. Also, astronomical events, changes in the cosmic radiation state, and the changes in the electromagnetic environment. So how do these changes, which correlate with much larger evolutionary cycles, affect how viruses are expressed, which mediate evolutionary changes? Could this relationship